Hopefully you can all hear me. I guess I could, talking on the importance of pollination, I could hold up a fruit and a vegetable here and say, basically I, um, I rest my case because who of us could do without these wonderful fruits or vegetables? Each of these come as a result of honeybee activity. They wouldn't be there without them. And behind all that, of course, is the need for sustainable nectar and pollen through the rest of the year when those fruits or vegetables aren't in flower. So really, just to begin, um, I'm greatly heartened by the turnout at this conference and the calibre of the people that have come here. Rodney and John and Sheree and I have been working on it and seeing the, uh, the great mix of people that have come here today and I'd really urge you to network while you're here over the next couple of days. Pollination is really not as simple as those. There's a great complex of interlinking factors in it. And I'll just go to the Thank next, yeah. All right. There's some seats in the front if you'd like. This goes, where do I poke that? Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep, okay. As Bruce said, that our economy is dependent on pollination. We estimate to the region of $5 billion annually. You take things like kiwi fruit, well, okay, pre PSA, it was probably worth a billion dollars, but it's still a vital, vitally important industry. Add to that things like our pastoral industries and our horticultural industries and our vegetable industries and in Canterbury, a seed industry. The whole economy is really based around agriculture still to a great degree, and a great portion of that is based around the importance of our pollinators. Demand is increasing. As we grow more things, as we intensify more, the demand for pollination is increasing, but we correspondingly haven't, up until now, looked at what, what do we do with the bees for the rest of the, the year? How do they survive through the spring, the autumn and the winter so that they're strong enough, so that they can do the jobs we need? We are reliant on honeybees. We have other bees in the country, of course, as you all know, but there's nothing comparable that we could raise, that we could develop on the sort of industrial scale that we can with honeybees. We can divide hives, we can make up more hives, we can't do that with, with bumblebees or any of the others. So we are really reliant on the health of the honeybees and the trees for bees story and what we're doing is a vital component of that. So I've gone through some of the statistics there. Roughly those 88,000 hives needed for pollination there's around about 420,000 hives in New Zealand now. 96% uh, of them are owned by the commercial sector. 4,000 registered beekeepers. And we're producing something like in the region of 15,000 tonnes of honey. And there's over $100 million worth of honey exported. Vital components in the, the not only just the health of the bees, but in the, the economics of beekeeping, that export dollar. Four major threats, incursions of new pests and diseases, like any agricultural industry, biosecurity is huge. We had varroa mite arrive 13 years ago, or it was discovered, and that's been a huge challenge up until now, and it's going to be even a greater challenge in the future. <coughs> Pesticides. We all hear about bee die-off overseas and um, in the popular press there's things like neonicotinoids being banned in France and Europe and that sort of thing. Well neonicotinoids have been around in New Zealand for 20 years. I'm not saying they're, they're wonderful, they're probably responsible for many bee deaths, but I'd like to say that it's actually all systemics that are really the problem nowadays. We've got new fungicides that are coming on market that are more likely a biocide rather than a fungicide. We used to think of things like the old um, carbamate type um, 
fungicides that were relatively benign compared with the systemics that are coming on board now. And in that, I'd like to acknowledge the work of John Hartnell and behind him, John McLean. John Hartnell, of course, with Federated Farmers Bees and doing the advocacy work that they do. But with the National Beekeepers Association, we have a committee of John McLean and another guy, Don McLeod, and a beekeeper in Canterbury, Roger Bray. And together they've worked on putting submissions to the EPA on a range of pesticides and continuing to do it. Really, that's voluntary work by our people, and there's no one that I could think of in the country doing anything similar to that, uh, you know, putting those representations on behalf of the bee, the honeybee. Very important work, very technical work. Of course, we're here at the Trees for Bees conference, and I'm not going to steal Linda's or anyone else's thunder talking about removal and decline of pollen sources that's going on. Canterbury, Waikato, more intensive farming areas. We're taking out bee, vital bee pollen and nectar sources. And with things like varroa mite and the economics of beekeeping, there's more multiple pressures on beekeepers coming on. Number one pest in the country is varroa mite. As I say, it arrived 13 years ago. Overseas, it's one of the probably major contributors to colony loss. And it is showing signs of uh, resistant to the, some of the synthetic chemicals that we use to control it in New Zealand. So as we get down that sort of program that, or that trend line that has happened overseas, unfortunately things may get worse before they get better. We need more research on that to develop better controls. We're doing things like breeding programs, there's at least two or three breeding programs in New Zealand that are starting to show some success, but it's a, a longer term um, control, if you like, on it. We have a, a endemic um, bacterial disease called American Fowl Brood, AFB for short. That's been around since the 18th, 1860s, or whenever bees were first brought here. Uh, we have a uh, program uh, under a pest management program, much the same as TB, that is very successfully controlling that. It's basically you're working around education of beekeepers and reporting. We're getting down to levels of AFB in the country of, in the region of 0.01% of hives. So we're getting very good control of that. It's actually a world leader. There's no one else in the world, no other country in the world that controls that particular disease as well as us. New diseases, always the biosecurity thing. And I put a, a note there about the importation of honey. Um, oh, there's a bit of pesticide poisoning. I'll just go back to that, just talk briefly on that. Success of governments, I guess, over the last 15 years, it could be, have wanted to allow the importation of honey from overseas, basically to, like the importation of, I guess, of apples and more lately, raw pork, to fit within the current trade policies in, that they have. In New Zealand, we, of course, have a Biosecurity Act that really is about um, ensuring the biosecurity and the health and the welfare of New Zealanders, its environment, and our economy. A balancing act to that, I guess, is a thing called the SPS Agreement, Sanitary and Phytosanitary Agreement, which we've signed up through the WTO. And that promotes trade, but trade in a safe way. The National Beekeepers Association and indeed Bee Industry Group are opposed to honey imports because of the, the risks it will bring. If we bring in honey, make no mistake, we will, bring in, will, we will be bringing in exotic um, organisms into it. Viable exotic organisms will come into New Zealand in that honey. Very much the same as raw pork. Raw pork has been allowed into New Zealand now, though it's recently 
The decision was made by the Director General of Agriculture to allow that in consumer packs. Uh, the pork industry, of course, is naturally up in arms about that because it will bring in a disease called PERS, which is a respiratory disease of pigs, and it will have a severe impact on our pig population if it gets out there into, the, into our national herd. How you contain a virus in New Zealand, I have no idea. Same with our bacterial diseases and viruses if honey comes into New Zealand. How on earth do you contain it? That's the import health standards uh, that are coming in about it. Anyway, that's, it's been a very vexed issue and it's continuing, I can tell you now. I've done a little bit about pesticide poisoning. Um, the neonicotinoids, the new systemic pesticides. The work that our committee is doing and also John, McLean, uh, John um, Hartnell. The HASNO Act, we found, is really weak in practice. It probably can't boils down to a resourcing issue. Resourcing not just in money, but in, in human terms as well. And we're actively working on that to lobby for that. We know that colonies are lost or weakened after pollination work. When they go into kiwi fruit, when they go into some of the seed crops, they do come out weaker. Okay, they're going into a very, I guess, uh, degraded environment in terms of diversity and pollen sources, but it does have an effect on them. As I say, we're intensifying agriculture, more weed control, that sort of thing. It's having a, having a big effect on, on certain areas of the country, and that's what the Trees for Bees program is really about. And multiple pressures on beekeepers once again. Disease control, biosecurity issues, poisonings and pollen sources. Um, one of the things we tried to do, uh, some or we are doing with some success, we've started a, a Bee Week program, and then I can't really point it, but... Oh, yeah. This here, we've got Rud Kleinplast, the previous president of the National Beekeepers Association, and David Carter, and right there is a live beehive. We had a presentation about three years ago, we took the live beehive and the beehive, we showed, took it along to the politicians. The whole idea was to try and impress on them the importance of pollination. Since then, that program has really gone out into the schools and it's become Bee Week, and this year it'll be Bee Month. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Annabelle Langbein, who is our ambassador for the bees, and we're involved with some of this. Very important to get it, that message out to children, out to the wider public about the importance of bees and pollination. Remedies, um, as I say, we don't, don't need new diseases. We need to improve control. We need to improve the way we test pesticides. We don't test pesticides over all stages of a bee's life. The large multinationals require only, well, sorry, test mainly bees on the adult bee stage. And if you can imagine an egg, a larvae, and a queen is probably much more susceptible to some of these pesticides. Pollen sources, trees for bees. More public policy awareness about it, bee-friendly environment. We need a, we talk about a $5 billion industry, what's worth $5 billion. We don't have any idea how how, with the true value of it. We haven't got a, uh, a real figure on that. Um, but um, we would, we're going to work along with that, with MPI, hopefully, to get some analysis done. We did see the, uh, um, the director of um, the... Sorry. The um, Minister of Agriculture recently, and he's agreed for MPI to work in with us with, for a, um, a bee health survey. So we'll be working in with John, the two main beekeeping industries, we'll be working together on that. So that's the end of it, but I'd like to just conclude. Worst case scenario, this could be the bee, honey bee of the future. Seriously, they use chicken feathers on sticks to pollinate crops in China. Some of the um, pear trees, you can go online and see this. 
people climbing up trees and touching pollen around, collecting pollen. I'm sure that as New Zealanders, as a country, we'd have far more drive and gumption to never let that sort of thing happen. But if we don't start to look at the importance of pollination, that could be an outcome, a worst case. But I'm sure we will not get there because I'm really heartened by who we have here today. So any more questions, if there's any time? No time, okay. Anybody got any questions for Barry? If I would say probably 80 or 90 per cent that it will happen, to be honest. Yeah. Do you think we've got a strong lobbying campaign? Uh, uh, well, we're going to, John and I are going to see the Minister, the, sorry, the Director General of Agriculture, who is the guy who will make the decision. We're meeting him next month, basically, I guess, in a plea to try and get a bit of common sense around it. Really, what's happened is that the uh, we, we have a Biosecurity Act and we have this agreement, agreements through the WTO and within that international agreement there is the precautionary principle where a country can elect to bar imports of risky items under a precautionary principle. Generally it's done usually in initial stages before an import health standard is issued because there's not enough science around it and they develop the science, they find the science says, yeah, it's OK, uh, yes, you can go ahead and import it. Um, and it can be used possibly even in the final stages, uh, but to my knowledge, and maybe I'll be corrected, it's never been used in New Zealand. We are a trading country and we're very independent on imports for our lifestyle and everything like that. And we need to be seen as open and free in the international arena. But if we're going to severely impact on the very things we need to trade on, and you've only got to look at PSA and kiwi fruit, okay, it's what happened there. If we get our honeybees compromised, we are screwed to a great degree. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm not aware of a honey import standard, uh, sorry, an import health standard for honey coming out anytime soon, although it's there is a bit of science yet to be done around it. We've, our association has been battling this since the 90s. We've taken MPI to court in the past. Uh, we've had street demonstrations and all that sort of thing. We've done a lot of lobbying. Um, John's been doing a lot of lobbying as well. But we think probably the law is bending too much one way towards trade at all costs rather than... John. I guess I heard, I was talking to a guy the other day who came from, comes from the Isle of Man and he imports a lot of honey into Europe and England and they have a particular American fowl brood problem around like hot spots around honey packing plants that import honey from overseas and I guess if we bought honey in from overseas that would be packed somewhere or processed somewhere, that is likely to be the, the hot spot. That's where it would pop up. But bear in mind, if we get any of these new exotic diseases in, we will not be able to contain them.